This is a Best in Tabletop special report. I go? I am here live with NIDS expert and, and official correspondent Tyler Bortel to talk about the NIDS fact this morning. I feel like we should start off like GW has brutally nerfed Tyranids. And now what happens? No, actually, we're both cool. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. It's an excellent set of changes. I'm very excited to talk about We both it. love NIDS and we both own massive NID collections. We both have have uh, done played nids at tons of tournaments. Uh, I haven't played new nids in tournaments, but Tyler certainly has. Going second overall, um, second place, yeah, at Seattle mm -hmm. Open, right? Yep. Uh, Two hundred person tournament. Tyler rolls on in, grabs second place, loses only one game over eight. Pretty darn good. So we wanted to jump on right away because GW has said we know it's two day two weeks since the book came out, and that used to be when you got facts. But what if we gave you a fact again? And what if it was a big deal? Okay, what if, what it, if is, it actually did something? It, it does. And it doesn't just change wording on things that we knew would change wording, right? It doesn't give mm -hmm. Harlequin troops core, right? It's not a thing that's just like, why is, why is there nothing in this book that has core? Like, it's not silly things, right? There are silly things in there. But it's yeah, but not... We have, we have meaningful, intentional changes meant to tone down the book that were not intended in the initial printing, and that is excellent to see. Exactly, and and there's a lot of stuff that fixes in the uh, the the uninteractiveness, which I think Absolutely. is a big complaint that people have had. There's nothing really about casting psychic powers from 55 feet away, but so be it. <laughs> the the you will never deny my powers under any circumstances is not being addressed, but okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through the fact for you guys, and we'll explain why each line matters if we think they do. And then at the end, we'll kind of share our thoughts with you guys about what specifically we're trying, what specifically we think this is going to do and how it's how it's going to look going forward. Uh, we're both, but in general, the vibe is high. Uh, we are Tyranids players. We do not need our book to be the most broken thing that's ever existed. Uh, the game balance post-data slate, I think both Tyler and I, Pretty good. Armies, mm -hmm. people like ar ar the armor of uh, contempt. Armor of you know, contempt. We, yeah, the armor of contempt changes big. Uh, the new chaos stuff looks good. The new knight stuff looks strong. Um, if you bring nids down enough, we might actually have a pretty healthy meta for the first time in a long time. So that's the optimism that we're we're operating under for the purposes of this. So the first thing it says is the, the, it says Leviathan psychic power hive ne nexus. And there's a change on the wording. What is this? What is this change actually doing? So the the change is that um, this is this is of course the spell that allows you to take any any unit in your army within synaptic link range of the psyker and put it into the imperative of the synap of any other synapse creature within synaptic link range of the psyker. Basically, you know, put someone into a canical or a doctrine that is not currently active. Okay. Uh, and the only change here is that the unit that is receiving the bonus has to be core now. Okay. Um, and the really big deal for this is two things. Number one, it means that the Malaceptor imperative, uh, or me, sorry, it means the Malaceptors don't get any imperatives from the spell. They only get them the regular way. So that means uh -huh. that they can only do the action and still cast Est on w the one turn that it's active for your whole army. And the same goes for the plus one cast, plus one deny five up, feel no pain against mortals from the Neurothrope. So those are just, Malaceptors only getting those the one turn that it gets them. And the second big one that I think a lot of people are going to feel even more than that is the Harpies. For a while, it's been a staple at a lot of uh, decent Tyranids lists to run two Harpies, one with Synapse, one with a 4-up Invuln. Uh, the Synapse one has Transhuman. The one with a 4-up Invuln can have Transhuman cast on it, or uh, use the stratagem for it. And then the one that doesn't have a 4-up Invuln can use this spell to always have a 4-up Invuln. Now that's not the case. Only one harpy is ever going to have an invuln of any kind, except on the one turn that they both have it, and that means that double harpy is no longer what's up. I don't think it ever was, but it definitely isn't now. Um, so I would expect to see as maybe one harpy in uh, in some lists, but it's a big hit to them. Okay, cool. The second thing is select one oh, for pow for stratagems, power of the hive mind. Select one hive tendril psyker character unit from your army. 
is what is was what the wording change is to the second. Yeah, segment. so this this is the second of several nerfs that are going to target directly at the malice scepter. Power <laughs> of the hive mind is the uh, is the stratagem that allows you to cast an additional power once you're done casting your regular powers. Uh-huh. Um, and obviously this still works on your neurothropes, your hive tyrants, the people they want it to, but it means that your malice scepter is not getting that illustrious fourth cast gone. And it also means that zone tropes take a bit of a hit. This is kind of an unfortunate casualty, but an understandable one. Um, but zone zones are still really need the extra cast in order to in order to be good, well, right? They're... They 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 only cast one spell, uh, and they know one spell. And really often, I'd like to have them cast. I would ha- liked. I would have had them cast smite and then neuroparasite. It's not a huge deal. They still have a lot of other utility. But um, John was already saying that he doesn't like zone tropes, and I think some more people might get on that train. Um, between not being able to put invulns on non-core models and not getting the extra cast out of a right. CP. so Well, we'll the dream here is that there's multiple good tier and lists they don't look like each other, right? That That is always the dream for me whenever they nerf a book, a really powerful book, is that you add variety back in. Because one yeah, of the I problems think... I have with, mm-hmm. with the Eldar book is that if it gets nerfed, it's really weird because there's really two things that are happening and there's a lot of unit overlap between the two things, between Hail and mm-hmm. Oldplay. And so I would love it if they, if they said, well, okay, Maliceptor's nerfed, Leviathan, this is nerfed, this is nerfed. And it would make it so that some people are playing Gorgon and some people are playing Kraken. Like, I mean, John's already playing Kraken, you know what I mean? But yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that's always my hope. Mm-hmm. All right. So, stra- so Overrun, uh, they changed the last sentence to say, uh, if there are no enemy models within engagement range of the unit, models in that unit can make a normal move. Now, to bring people up to speed on Overrun, this is the thing where you kill a unit in combat and you get to go run away. In 8th edition, it said nobody could be within three inches of you. Um, they removed that language for ninth edition, which some of us felt was a really big change because it means you only have to kill the thing you charged and it doesn't matter if some other bloke is... Bloke? <laughs> if some other bloke is standing there staring at you and, like... Chuck used to interweave his units so that I wouldn't be able to overrun away. Like because of that three inch language, you could play around it. So what I'm curious here is what what is this fundamentally changing about the way you saw it playing now? Tyler? Yeah, so the the big deal here is that overrun as written in the ninth edition codex does not work. Um because it's used at the end of the fight phase instead of consolidating, which okay. like Wait, so do I not consolidate? Like, it wasn't really clear what that was supposed to mean. Now it's very clear. Forget about consolidation. It's just at the end of the fight phase, which um, is really interesting because it means you get to consolidate, first of all. It's so you think about the fight phase? It's after it's, you get punched back? It's at the end of the fight phase, after you get punched back. So oh, this is a not, bit of... But this language doesn't say that, right? That's just in the book. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. Okay. Yeah. Um, this replaces the part that says instead of consolidating. Okay. Um... So what that means is that if there's only like one unit, you go and you beat the crap out of it, you're getting to console three and then do your normal move later, which is a huge buff. Um, I I really like to do this play because remember, you don't actually have to be the one to do the killing. You just have to have charged and not be in engagement range. So I love to combo this with like a punchy unit and a unit of gargoyles and the gargoyles go and they get three extra inches of movement now because they'll pile three console three and then their normal move of 12. That's great. Um, What it also means though is locking into the end of fight phase means that your opponent can be a little bit tricky if they put a couple units out in that if they can get in eventually through their activations get in then you won't be able to use this to get away it's a little buff it's a little nerf it just it works now is the important thing um i think that this is kind of a wash and overall was just a good change yeah and we'll we're going to talk about overrun more after we talk about encircle the prey so because I think those two are very related to each other in the way the game is Indeed. played. So Encircle the Prey is next. So Encircle the Prey is the stratagem where the Tyranid players were, at the end of their turn, putting anything that has burrow or wings, basically, which is like 95% of the book. Not really 95 but it's a lot. It's like, it's certainly Raveners, it's certainly the, the Fly Rent, and those are the big targets that were doing it, but lots of other things. Gargoyles could do it. Lots of other things could do it. And it happened at the end of the turn. So what was happening is people were scoring Stranglehold. They were scoring uh, the spe- the special uh, priority missions, in the, the special objectives in the missions. They were doing all types of crazy stuff and then just leaving and not being able to be interacted with. So what GW said is, man, also, by the way, you could do as many as you wanted because it's out of phase. 
that didn't get addressed, but didn't, but it did get addressed by them fixing the other issue. So what they've said for encircle the plane, play is that you pray, <laughs> circle the plane. <laughs> it just kills flyers. You have if you're tearing it surround the plane, Tyler, then the plane crashes. <laughs> Call and circle the plane. That's all I did all eighth edition. I'm glad to see it back. <laughs> <laughs> so encircle the prey. It says use this stratagem at the end of your movement phase, which puts it in phase. So it's one thing per turn. And it means that you don't get to punch. You don't get to shoot. You don't get to psychic. You don't get to do any of the things that people were doing before you have to go back. So this is a massive targeted nerf on this stratagem, which, by the way, was wildly not okay. It could have at least been two CP, right? Like it could have at least been two CP and limited mm -hmm. to once per turn. Like it, it yep. was wildly broken. We had a conversation about whether it was the best stratagem in the book, and at the end of the conversation was here for Dita's going, "Yeah, okay, it is." Right? Like, so yeah. what do you think, Tyler? What? How does this? I... How does this affect the game? This this is the most fundamental change to the way that NIDs operate. Yep. All the attacks on the Maliceptors, whatever. This right here fully changes the game. And it goes from Tyranids being the best single-player 40k army of all time to being an actual very competent trading army, which is what they probably should be. I'm a little bit bummed to see it entirely ripped out and taken oh, out yeah. back, but I understand the decision. Yeah. Uh, it was a lot of fun. There was cute things you could do with it. I would have... I might have done something a bit more nuanced and said something about monsters costing two or, or messing with the something or other, but I understand why they did this and I'm not holding it against them. Uh, it's gone. You're going to use it the way that everyone else uses their Return to the Shadow style strats to, you know, get R&D on a later turn or to just reposition something across the table. It's it's not going to get used out of some very niche situations. I want to attribute this quote to the right person, Tyler, and I can't remember who said it. I think it was at our dinner at Seattle Open, so you might remember. Mm -hmm. But someone was saying that, or maybe it was in Discord yesterday. I don't remember now. But it, recently I was in a conversation and someone explained that GW cares the most when nerfing about mechanics that feel bad for the majority of the player base. They're more worried about you rolling up to the table and saying, ah, oh, F and A, why am I playing Tyranids again? This is an awful experience. They're much more worried about that than they are about the actual win percentage. Sorry, my dog's working. The actual win percentage of Tyranids. Like, they're more worried about that feel bad. And remember the first time Hank played against New Nids? We had a, a stream game of that. Hank, who is a very, very competent player and a very calm personality, got really frustrated because of the lack of, of interaction that you can have in response to the nids. And I think that's what this change is about. The fact Absolutely. that you can YOLO a fly rent across the table, psychic something, if it has a gun, shoot something, run in and punch something, score stranglehold, and then leave, and, and then and have a 3d6 charge on your way back in. Like, that was a very big feel bad for people. And it was the most complained about thing that I heard. So as much as it sucks because i think it's in circle of prey was an awesome stratagem mm -hmm. it's still a neat stratagem it still does what it still helps uh you i'll talk about that in a second it's mm -hmm. still a neat stratagem i'll explain why in a moment <laughs> but it is a much necessary nerf to make the rest of the game able to play against this book without hating life that's my take yeah absolutely i was finishing games with 1200 1400 1600 points left on the table because of this stratagem and not having to trade for anything and that was just uh that was a fundamentally silly way to play the game, so I'm I'm excited to see what bugs look like post in circle. Yeah, absolutely for sure. So what I was gonna say is so the stratagem now is a lot like the GSC stratagem where you can pick up acolytes and you can bring them back in on the next turn somewhere. And for GSC, that's been a big tool because of R and D, because of taking primary and such. And I think this stratagem pivots into that utility use of there are certainly situations where you want to take something, a unit of ten gargoyles. And you want to put them up into deep strike and bring them back on the next turn uh, for screening, for mission play, for you know whatever. It's still a, it's still a good stratagem at one CP. I'm glad they didn't raise the CP and then nerf it. Oh man. right, which is the path that I thought would happen. Um, mm -hmm. but that's what I think of that of that of that nerf. Yeah, I will say the other big thing here is that it changes the way you have to play with a flyrant. Because it, you can't take a, the complete, uh, it takes the puts the risk back into the situation. It was very common in the past to be like, oh man, 
My fly rate hits a five on his advance. I'll go for that 10 inch charge. If I make it, cool, I beat the crap out of you. And if I don't, there are no consequences other than losing a CP. <laughs> right. So yeah. putting consequences into 10 inch charges as a risk, excellent decision on GW's part. Yeah, and, and I also think that uh, I'm a big fan of being able to understand the threat range of things. And I think mm-hmm. that because the fly rent, the fly rent is now going to say, am I going to go trade? Or am I going to overrun back to the tyrant guard, right? Mm-hmm. And that overrun back to the tyrant guard, because of the way they change the tyrant guard, you have to be behind them. You can't just be, mm-hmm. you're not running back to be 2.9 inches in front of them like we were when the book first came out. Mm-hmm. And you can't advance. So it might be a 17 because of adrenal glands, right? But it's going to be a 16 or 17 inch that you just know is the maximum distance that Flyrant can go. And you can look at that and you can look at where it has to be to get even a half inch behind the Tyrant guard. And mm-hmm. you will know that that is, the, that is it. That as far mm-hmm. as that Flyrant is going from home without it, being, without it turning itself into a trade situation. Because yeah. that big boy is great, but he is not durable enough. He's not going to last a turn on his own if he doesn't go back to the tower guard or he doesn't fly up into the sky. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he's. But you think he's still good and still oh, yeah, in every list. I, I think he still hits like an absolute train. I think that you can't rely on him to be an automatic five onto the last anymore, which is annoying. But I mean, people like Trimble was taking him without tyrant guard in the first place and just throwing him away. And as a two hundred and ten point trade piece. He makes a pretty compelling case for it. So Because he's going to kill you, 210 points like every game. Yeah, handily. Um, yeah. He also just, as a threat projector of saying, hey, if you come within 20 inches, that unit dies and then bounces back. Look out. Yeah. Like, that's that's a valuable thing to have. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Next up is Shadow Operations for Nodes. Uh, change the third sentence to read, if this action is successfully completed, play one objective marker anywhere within one inch of the unit that completed this action. Place one objective. I don't understand this. Um, this is the this is the, this one of the special missions, and I've never played with it, so I don't actually understand this change. If yeah, you so want to run it was, down for us, yeah, there was there's a little bit of an awkward wording on the way that this shadow operation works, where to activate the thing, you have to. Um, oh my gosh, what is it? It's something like you have to be wholly within six as a unit, but then the objective marker need. Oh, you yeah, you needed the unit to be within six of the opponent's DZ. But then you needed, needed to place the objective marker within one inch, within one inch of you, and wholly within the opponent's DZ. So you would have actually had to have been within one inch in the first place. This gives you a little bit more breathing room and actually okay. makes a little bit more sense. Um, I don't think that it makes this like some kind of auto take, but now this is an objective marker that you should really consider, especially on something like a sweep and clear style deployment, where this zone is actually pretty meaningful, um, especially if you're taking a lot of troops like gargoyles. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, and then synapse becomes an aura. I think that's just a that's just a, them being being thorough, right? Because there's a bunch yeah. of stuff in the game that turns auras off, and so mm-hmm. we need to know if synapse is an aura, and it wasn't clear. Yep, okay. it's definitely an aura. That means you can shoot it with the uh, with the uh, sanctus when you're when you're in that when you're in that gene stealer cult versus tyranid matchup. That's so so rough. <laughs> the gene stealer cult. <laughs> <laughs> we're just like our book is cool and the tier nerds are like oh your book is only cool well <laughs> yeah I, play, I played that round eight at seattle it was not a good time for the gsc i wonder so, if you just had nine leviathan warriors what how much of the gsc army you could kill like if you oh just gosh. had that one unit against the whole gsc army and you were just wading towards them i wonder how much of that you, them you could kill before you died i bet it would be a thousand points <laughs> it, it'd be something like that all right moving on Sorry, GSC, your book's not good enough. Um, okay, and then the next one is, believe it or not, the Hive Tyrant isn't supposed to have two heavy Venom cannons. Now, you shocked me with this, Tyler, because when they when they, when they they ruled this for Dallas, mm-hmm. you said, you've got to be effing kidding me. And mm-hmm. then when, when, you, when you guys were getting ready for Seattle, I asked about it, and you said, actually, mm-hmm. I think the wording is clear that you can have two. So, like, oh, you convinced absolutely. yourself that the word, that raw, you could have two. Yeah, oh yeah, you know, there was never a question about raw. The question was, that is a stupid ruling, because obviously that's not intended, and I'm annoyed by Dallas making that. And then GW said the same ruling, and I said, okay, sure, why not? I'll put another heavy venom cannon on my tyrant then, is literally what you said. Yeah. 
Um, I, yeah, I guess I'll go do that. Went out to the garage, found an extra heavy venom cannon and stuck some magnets in it. I'm glad that I stuck some magnets in it because there was no way it was sticking around. But while it was an option, it was kind of an auto take. You look at the top five lists at Seattle. Four of them have it. Maybe even all five. It's not only did you guys have it, but you and John at the least brought both pirate models. Yes. And both versions of the list because you couldn't get a ruling answer ahead of the tournament. And you were deciding which version of the list to put in Saturday morning. Uh, Friday morning, yeah. <laughs> Friday morning. That was it amazing. Was, uh, all hell. Hey, guys, yeah. the Flyman wasn't supposed to have two ridiculously good guns. Only one. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Or the Tyrant, rather. Next up. Yeah. Uh, they gave Zumthrub Synapse. That gives them Transhuman if they're Leviathan. It, mm-hmm. They probably were supposed to have it already. Uh, but we were not playing. I wasn't playing with them having it because they didn't have it. So they a, they ruled it at GW that they did have it because they have the ability and they're obviously supposed to have the keyword. But yeah, this okay. this is a Harlequin troops getting core on steroids. There was there was no way we weren't seeing that change. Good change. Alrighty. Uh, whoa. What? What? I'm confused by this Tyrannocyte change. Uh, I guess I have a thing here. Did it not initially have them as dedicated transports? Did I miss that? So I don't know. Confused. People were taking so many of them. How were they justifying yeah. that if they weren't dedicated transports? I mean, if you're going to take them and you're going to abuse the the no, the obvious nonsense that ends up getting fixed here, I just I can't imagine what that you would think that that was okay. Oh yeah, they're a heavy support in the book. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, cool. So someone must so, have ruled them as a dedicated transport at the tournaments that they were being taken at because yeah. people had I, like nine of them. I will say, as a point of clarification, at Dallas, they did not rule that this could work rules as written, which was very much appreciated. And let's talk about uh, what got fixed here. Okay, so um, a lot of the, in a lot of the game, there's a stratagem that we usually think of as the drop pod stratagem that ba- or, or ability that basically says your thing comes down nine away and the things inside of it come out and they're also nine away. It's how it's mm-hmm. written, written everywhere. And for the yeah. trauma site, for reasons that are almost certainly bad proofreading, it did not include that the Tyrannocyte itself had to be nine inches away. So the Tyrannocyte could come down one inch away, because it couldn't come in engagement range, we're pretty sure. But it could come in, it could come down one inch away, and we you could then charge it in. And it's this big thing that's hard to kill, and so you could bring down like five of them, and you could just like charge your opponent's whole gun line, and just like, here we all are, now everything has to fall back and shoot, which some armies just can't do. This was never great, it was, but this is a clever over good uh, rules abuse. I think none like Seattle Open was never going to be won by nine Tyrannocytes, but it is it is a wording mistake that got fixed. Is what I would say. Yep. Okay. If uh, if you didn't follow all of that, they do exactly what you think they do now. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> if you, yeah. if you don't want to read the change, don't bother. All right, we got uh, one more uh, one more errata. I don't know what this is. Uh, glossary adaptive physiology has changed to a unique upgrade that can be given to hive tendril monster models excluding characters in titanic yeah so the adaptive physiology is the points upgrades that you can give to monsters give them synapse give them an invul right. give them what have you um there was a bit of contention because on the page that describes them it says they cannot be given to characters or titanic but in the glossary it said they cannot be give to, given to named characters or titanic Okay. And I believe in the index it still says named characters or Zitanic as well. And people were like, which one is it? Can a regular Hive Tyrant or a Turvagon have one? And this is one of the places where I think this is like a typo that kind of saved their butts. Because I think they were supposed to be able to. And then they realized how strong it would be. And decided to say, oh, no, no, let's go with the typo. No characters can have them because it would be too strong. So no Turvagons with four-up invulns, no Hive Tyrants with all his dust. The book continues to work as printed. Nothing, nothing changes here. Now, there's two Q&A fracks for the Maliceptor. Do either of those play the way, change the way it's played, or they clarify, you think? Uh, the first one, well, these were both, like, big issues of discussion. Uh, okay. the, the first one, I think, everyone was sort of on the same page about. The second one was not ruled this way at GW. Um, so the first one is the Enraged Reserves, one of the, um, excuse me, one of the adaptive physiologies allows you to fight up a bracket. Oh, I, have a, I have to step away for a minute. Will you talk through these and I'll be right back. Yeah, no problem. Cool. So the first one, the, the Enraged Reserves allows you to fight up a bracket. And uh, they specify here that that does not count for the mortal wounds you're getting out of the Maliceptor. Maliceptor at top bracket does three mortal wounds every cast on a 7+, plus, then two, then one. Um, and they, they ruled that it's 
and Rage Reserve only affects characteristics, which don't include data sheet abilities like that, so it's always going to be whatever it corresponds to your wound count that's left. You can obviously still heal back up to it, but no getting around it with that. I still, well, for a while, if it weren't for the other FAQ that said that um, you can't use the powers from the hive mind on uh, non-core, or so or non-characters rather, so not malice scepters, I would say that Enrage Reserve is still worth considering, because the increased mobility is nice, as well as the free use of that stratagem, but now you don't get to use the stratagem at all, so it doesn't make a difference. And then the second one is a clarification that performing a psychic action does count against your number of total casts. This was something that, depending on how you read the rules, you might rule one way, you might rule the other. GW initially ruled that, no, it does not count, because rules is written. It doesn't seem like it counts. But they've decided to say, yes, it does. Um, and in the future, or this means that the Malice Scepter is hard-capped at two casts. It was four casts a week ago, but now the psychic action counts as one, and you can't use the stratagem for a second. So your Malice Scepter is doing half as many casts, half as many additional mortal wounds, uh, and as a result of that is going to probably drop in uh, how many lists we're seeing it in, certainly in how many lists we're seeing with two or three of them. Um, so it's no cast twice. twice. No. At most, ever. Only ever twice. And if it uses its action, it only That's casts one of once. Them. Yep. No, but then it only casts once, right? Because psychic actions take away your psychic powers, right? Unless you're in the imperative, the Mal Scepter imperative, in which you can do the action and then cast once more. Okay. And so it's doing, basically the most mortals it's doing is two smites. No, one smite and another power. So is it doing nine mortals? Is that the most it's doing? So, I, I mean, if, if you hot roll, it could, it could still do 18. Because you'll do three from each of the casts, and then you could super smite for six, and you could neuroparasite for six. Okay. Um, but that's like very niche specific. On average, if we're just talking smite scream, and then the two uh, the two uh, flat threes, we're doing an average of about ten mortal wounds, which is still great. But remember Absolutely. that it's remember that it's a unit that doesn't have guns. Yeah, it's a 170 point unit that's only way of dealing damage is doing ten mortal wounds to something within 12 inches in the psychic phase. Yeah, it's still very reasonably priced for its durability, but it's no longer the everything in range dies menace that it used to be. Yeah. Um, well, before it was, yeah. we actually felt when the book first came out in our tier in the chat that it was the most egregiously bad data sheet. Like it was the most poorly thought through data sheet because of because of all this, <laughs> and because it wasn't clear if you could do psychic actions if your psychic action counted as one of your casts. Mm -hmm. So people were just like, well, I'm going to cast four times. I'm going to do 17 mortals. Like, it was really dumb. And at 100, yeah. it's not 300 points, right? It's 170. It's a lot. Like, 170 means, 170 is a fire prism with vectored engine, right? It needs to be a very, like, reasonable piece of your army that does something. 170 is my big unit of warp spiders in my in my elder list. Like, it needs to be a core piece of what you're trying to do at 170. And I think it still is, but... I can't imagine taking two, which is a little unfortunate because I own two now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's very funny. We've been watching this eBay marketplace where Malice Scepter is going for two, three, four hundred dollars, <laughs> and I think next week they're going to be going for about twenty-five or thirty. So if you're a fan yeah, of the so model, if you want that was to run a great time Malice Scepter, now's your time, my man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So first, my first question for you is: Does this mean Leviathan becomes less popular? Because what we're seeing so far is almost everyone's playing Leviathan, except for John Lennon, is kind of what the what I've seen. And he's mm -hmm. playing Kraken, which he did win Seattle Open with. So I'm not saying he's not wrong, <laughs> but uh, he's playing Kraken. So what do you think of High Fleet Choice now as we go forward? Yeah, so it's it's a bit complicated. I think the big thing to keep in mind when we're talking about most people, Leviathan, John on Kraken, uh, and I'm sure there are plenty of other people on Kraken. Uh, I'm sure you're all doing very well. I played some very very fun yeah. games with Gorgon. Yeah, there, there's lots of cool stuff. The Behemoth is out there. Whatever the case is, the pro one of the problems with the Tyranid book is that it is too well, it is too good externally for us to know how it is internally balanced. So whatever you take in Tyranids, it's strong enough to win a major. So I don't know what the best high floor was. And my floor, yeah. Case, well. Yeah, exactly. Now, now, now we'll we'll talk about it now in a minute. But because of that, Leviathan was the easiest to sort of comprehend the strength of, so everyone jumped mm -hmm. there. 
These changes may change that. I was playing Leviathan. I'm super bummed, honestly, by the implementation of the psychic power change because I really liked that at, uh, that spell. I think it was a lot of fun. Fortunately, most of the things that I was putting it on are core anyway. My only question I have about it is our Biovore's core because Warriors and Tyrant Guard and Raveners are all core, and that's good, but I don't know. I mean, if, if Biovore's Bio are core, core, I'm going to be really frustrated because, like, in Eldar, none of our heavy support are core. Biovores are core. Biovores oh, and Pyrovores. Okay. So, I, so yeah. So, th this doesn't actually make a huge difference, but not being able to put the, um, not being able to put the, basically, me, oh, man, yeah. That means that the plus one to cast est thing from the Neurothrope is just like not applicable anymore because there are no core Psyker units unless Zoe's are core, but Zoe's are casting at plus three. So, like, what does it yeah. matter if you put them to plus four? Um, so that one's kind of a bummer. I still think the utility is really great. The ability to put a core unit into five up, five up just helps a lot. The transhuman is still very strong. Um, and I think that as we transition away from some of these bigger bugs into what I think is going to be a very me even more medium bug focused army, I think, think you're going to want transhuman on your warriors. I could be wrong about that. The other thing to keep in mind. I, I, well, that's mm -hmm. what I was going to say. Let me, let yeah. me, don't Go lose your it. thought. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually think that the Tyranid Warrior is now the most egregious data sheet mm -hmm. of the, uh, and Raveners are really good and the Flyer and, I mean, like, there's mm -hmm. lots of arguments that, to tell me I'm wrong. I'm not saying I think it's the most egregious data sheet and I, and let's fight. Like, I'm just saying mm -hmm. that it's certainly in the argument. And Absolutely. I think in particular when it's, when it's Leviathan. So mm -hmm. Tyranid Warriors are not just a little bit undercosted for what they do. I think that they're massively undercosted. Like they're, it's rough to find an and and um and not an amalgamate a uh, analog. It's hard. It's difficult to find an analog from other books. It's hard mm -hmm. to find something that that does what they do as well as they do for their points. And when you put transhuman on them, it's such a survivability increase on something that doesn't natively have an invul. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's just it's such a big deal. So for me, I'm going to play a ton of warriors. And that means probably Leviathan. That's where my brain's yeah. at. I, mm -hmm. I'm not as advanced right now with the book as Tyler is. I haven't played nearly as many reps as he has. But my, mm -hmm. that's where my brain's going. Is that warriors are the way, and we should have tons of them. So. For sure. The I'm definitely I've, I'm definitely gonna be trying out 30, 40 warrior lists in the next couple of days. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Those will be Leviathan. The other thing that I think is detracted from Kraken a bit here is the change to Encircle. Um, because if the plan for the Hive Tyrant is now he's only going to bounce 17 so he can bounce back 17 and be safe, suddenly the fact that he can threaten at 25 and charge isn't nearly as meaningful because that's a one-way trip that I don't know that you want to be sending him on. Um, so we'll see how much people really end up enjoying that stratagem. Army-wide D3 plus 3 advance, very nice. Plus 1 AP and Armor of Contempt, very nice. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I think that Leviathan is not dead, but I also think that if you are trying to figure out something else, there's so much left for us to figure out with this book. Uh, and this only opens, opens it up more. Uh, so and God forbid they actually nerf nids enough that it makes some sense to take GSE with them. I mean, that hasn't, <laughs> I don't think that's happened yet, but like, you guys have to understand where my humor is coming from on that. I love the Gene Steeler cult book. Like if you just are looking at that book in a vacuum. If you're not thinking about all the books that came out around it, like if you were, if that book came out last year, that book is so amazing. It's so great. We would all be taking it to tournaments. All the Nits players would be happily playing it. It's mm -hmm. just that that book came out surrounded by Eldar, Tau, Custodes, now Chaos Knights, and Tyranids. It's just that that book came out at the wrong time to be, yeah. to be good enough. But I would love it if there were viable reasons to put GSC and NIMS together. That would make me very happy. Because I, mm -hmm. to me, that's how GSC sh most feel right. Because I'm more a Tyranid player than I'm a GSC player. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love forces. And when, and I'm definitely going to be trying some stuff to see if we can make it happen. But uh, we'll, we'll have Someone to. Someone says that, that they bet you're happy that they didn't touch your sack. Yes, they did not touch touch the sack. I'm very pleased with this. I don't know how they would if they wanted to, but it's oh, I love it so much. How did um, you make it happen on the screen? I didn't even know that was a thing he could do. You can you can click on the if you pull up the comments tab, you can just click on them and they'll, and they'll pop up like that. Oh, um, nice. they kind of changed the sack because a lot of the parasites' ridiculousness was involving in circles. So she's not quite as as ridiculous as she she used to be. But um, I'm definitely not taking her out of my list anytime soon. And the sack is staying on. Respect the I sack. don't own that yet. I need to buy that model. I bet, the, Indeed, I bet she's I with the light. Yeah, yeah. She, she's not hard to find. 
<laughs> Unlike uh, everything else I'm trying to buy right now. Exactly. So, okay, let's let's go through our comments really quick um, and see. I, I think this one's really great from the same guy. Mm -hmm. Seems like great changes. Just trimmed off the ridiculous stuff, but kept the many fundamental strengths intact. I think that's wonderfully put, don't you think? Like, Yeah, ab absolutely. Like, um, I, think only... this, I think in Circle was the most ridiculous thing in the book. And mm -hmm. so, yes, 100%. Yeah. Getting rid of that, I think there's still some big points changes that we're going to see in the next points update, but those don't come out in FAQs, so it, it seems reasonable to me. Absolutely right. This one, this one we basically talked about. Do we see less Kraken now? I think we see more Kraken, to be honest. I agree with Tyler's uh, comment that going as far isn't as good, but I think that with... I think there's a couple things happening, one of which is I don't think we're going to see double double Tyrant as much as we are. Tyler still thinks, yes, that they're both still mm -hmm. really good on their own. I think that this, the, the cost of having two tyrants is going to be in some lists not worth it with <laughs> Encircle Gun. Um, mm -hmm. And that changes the math of what you're taking in general. So that could mean Kraken's good. It could mean Gorgon's good. It's a, it's such a fundamental change. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I think that's all. Yeah. The... Uh, that commenter also asked about Fexes, which we haven't mentioned. Okay. Uh, I don't like card effects personally all that much just because... They're either not very fast or they only operate in one phase. You kind of get one or the other. Um, and I don't think that that's a fundamentally very useful unit, but I could be wrong. I'd love to see it. They're very cool models. So we'll see what's out there. Carnifixes are weird because like regularly there's a book that my friends are playing a specific version of and there's a bunch of other people playing a really skewed version of it that my friends won't listen to. And this is one of those times. Like, in, mm -hmm. like there are people that are like, I'm just going to play nine Carnifexes and it's really great. And Tyler and Alex and John are just nowhere near that. So it's really, really, it's really, really weird. And then uh, this is a, uh, this is just a, a, you know, we're just, this is just a lethal weapon quote with a picture of a guy from <laughs> lethal weapon and his name. That's all this is. All right. So that's what we think. I think um, this takes Tyranids from the only S tier army to one of the S tier armies. I don't think that this is a particularly, I don't think this destroys them. I think their book is incredibly strong. Um, I think that it probably makes Eldar happy the most. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Eldar had the tools already to hang, but weren't favorited. If you're if you're considering equal skilled opponents, I mm -hmm. don't think that I would have favored the the Eldar player in those matchups. Now maybe I would, but Eldar is still not seeing widespread success if you look at the numbers. So. What else do you think? What else do you think comes up even with with Tyranids if they come down, Tyler? What do you, as a Tyranid player, what are you thinking about building against? What, what are my thing? Uh, oh, what what? Uh, yeah, like what do you, what are the matter? enemies you think that you most have to worry about right now as a Tyranid player with these changes? Yeah, so with with these changes, I become increasingly concerned about Thousand Suns. I already was concerned yes. about Thousand Suns, but now it's like, oh man, because. One of the fundamental good things that you can do into Thousand Suns is because you're encircling, you're not giving them slingshot targets mm -hmm. while trying to take center board. And now that you can't do that anymore, those 20 Terminators are down your throat real fast. So you better have a really good solution for 20 Scarab Occult Terminators that you can do in one and a half to two turns. Yep. Um, so that's really, especially with the Malice Scepter not being as effective into them, that's scary. Um and also, I, um, a lot of Thousand Suns players are adding knights to their list, and we talked about this in the in, the, in our uh, Tyranna chat earlier today. That's a big deal because the the main problem Thousand Suns had. Zach won a GT with Thousand Suns, and he'll tell you that he had terrible, overprinted, awful long range shooting in that list because long range shooting is so important for the way that army functions. Mm -hmm. If a lot of them, they're just going to slam in three Helbrins. And those Helbrins are going to have a reroll to hit. They're going to have a reroll to wound, I believe. They get both. They're just going to be such an interesting additional power to that um, that I think Tyranids care about. Because if you do the math, it doesn't kill the Metal Scepter in one go, but it sure could. It sure could. So yeah. Knights in general are going to be a really weird thing to think about. Because at the moment, I got to play into Knights once at, uh, at Seattle. Um, the Metal Scepter just eats the Knights. He says, here's four casts. Here's a dead Knight. Here's, the other one says, here's three casts, here's a dead knight. And not having that power anymore, uh, tied in with not having the double tyrant, I'm not really sure what the plan is. I'm really glad that you don't have 160-point <laughs> model that trivializes an entire codex. I think that's great. 
Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, is so we'll what see. you just said, basically. Uh-huh. I mean, but yeah, I mean, but yeah, so like other codexes still do, like Hammerheads still exist. Uh, so we'll see how those sorts of matchups end up going. But if Chaos Knights, it's in particular become a big threat because, man, do you not want to melee Chaos Knights? No, uh, you don't. And you don't, want, uh, and you don't want to have a gunfight with the Imperial Knights either. You want to charge yes. the Imperial Knights and you want to shoot at the Chaos Knights. And that's a meta right there. Yeah. Uh, commenter asks, how about triple tyrants? Do it! Do it, I tell you. I think it's awesome. Uh, I think that um, there's a list that has like 18 behemoth tyrant guard and three tyrants in there somewhere, oh, oh. and man, that list looks like fun. Because you basically have armor of contempt. You got a bunch of T6, four yeah. wound dudes with zero up saves in cover. Because one thing we, that we, that's being completely missed by all these people taking three tyrant guard to put behind a wall to save their tyrant is that tyrant mm-hmm. guard, in my opinion, are also under costed. Oh, 100%. They guard, are, Pyro Wars, even, Warriors, even, even without being even without being a, even without being a bodyguard, they just don't cost enough. You should play tw- play a game with ten of them and see what you think. Two units of five, run around with them, punch things like yeah. I, like hold objectives. Like they're di- they are they are a legitimately uh, powerful thing on their own that mm-hmm. isn't really getting hasn't been getting a lot of attention. Absolutely, man. That's the saddest sentence ever. For people that don't play Tyranids, fifteen Tyrant Guard, three Tyrants, and you still have a, have bundles of points. I don't know how many how many points are in those bundles. I think it's a thousand, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, f- fifteen Tyrant Guard is like seven hundred and something points. The Tyrants okay. push it to like thirty. It's like yeah, like seven or eight hundred points of play. Okay, um, still. that's still a lot of play. Uh, and you're gonna man, have a man. Rope, right? Yeah. So, so I'm yeah. like, mm-hmm. you're gonna have a I really. Rope. The points. fun thing there is that now you have like a throwaway tyrant because your tyrant guard are you're to the last. So like someone parks their death star unit in the middle and you're like, tyrant, go! And the thousand sons of player says, ha, you fool! And punches him in the face and he dies. And then all the tyrant guards say, yes! That one! Get him! <laughs> uh, I, I don't even know how that stratagem works. If, but if it's one unit or it's all units of tyrant guard. But I want to do the thing. Because plus one to hit, plus one to wound, plus four to charge is too funny to pass up on. It is too... No, I- I haven't worked close at the the data for this. Uh, mm-hmm. Watch Fight Club next Tuesday to see the data on this. But I haven't seen the data on this. Uh, but it seems to me that my friends who play Tau don't feel like their nerfs were particularly egregious. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, is Tau now a thing that that hangs really well with Tyranids? What do you think of that? With these Tau things? was already a thing that terrifies Tyranids. There was no one at Seattle that brought Quad Hammerhead, or at least that I saw doing well with it. That list was already terrifying. I played a practice game into, I don't remember if it was three or four hammerheads, but I just lost both Malice Scepter's top one because I was curious to see if they would do it, and they did. Um, so, like, that's scary. Uh, and with Tyrants, or in, um, with Tyrants, Rince no longer getting to leave the table, that, like, that's very dicey because the main way that you're dealing with Tau is getting in and hitting them pretty hard and then leaving. Mm-hmm. So I think that Tau are in a fantastic spot to do well, as long as they can figure out the Eldar problem, which mm-hmm. I'm curious to see what they can do about it. But Eldar aren't nearly popular enough that I think it's that big of a threat. Tau are, yeah, I think it's, yeah, your, your top tier builds right now are El- Eldar, Tyranids, Tau, and um, A Thousand Suns. I think those are your well, like, top four. So like we're, one of the things that we're going to be talking about on BiffPod this week, uh, on mm-hmm. Best in Faction on Sunday, we have Hank on, who went fifth. At uh, best in table top open. Normally we'd grab the winner, which is John Lennon. And certainly I'm capable of grabbing John Lennon as a, a guest. I've certainly done it before. But um, with Tyler on TNG talking about NIDS the day before, we thought we'd talk about Eldar. And one of the things we're going to be talking about is that, in my opinion, the mm-hmm. power of that book uh, is being completely missed because of how hard the army is to play. Um, and so what you have is, compared to other armies, Tyranids, Tau, Custodes, it's much harder to play the really good tier, the really good Eldar list. Um, our our listener or viewer, I guess, uh, shared this, which I think is wonderfully put. Eldar is paper at the end of the day, so it's not as easy to just bandwagon, in my opinion. Mispositioning means the wheels fall off quickly, so I doubt they'll see widespread success anytime soon, in my opinion. That's really he's really spot on because what happens with Eldar is the really good players will just yolo at you with an incredibly fierce amount of power. And the Eldar lists, as powerful as they are, have a really difficult time when you just walk at them ready to punch. If you just do a vanilla and you just go on the line with your fists up and you just go at them and you just bring violence upon them, a lot of Eldar players are just going to completely fold because as powerful as the Eldar stuff is, it's fragile. 
it's not as fragile as it's always been. Like lots of things have a five up interval. There's the save sixes. Like there is some durability there, but it's not even remotely as dur durable as Tau and Tyranids are, both of which are very durable armies in my opinion. So I think that you're looking at a meta that is dominated by Tau, uh, Eldar, Harlequin still, and and uh, Nits. That's that's where I'm at right now. But I'm super. I think Thousand Suns with Knights could be in that list. We need to see. They're, if they're not in that list, they're right next to it. They're right below it. If they're not in that list, uh, I think Harlequins will start to fall as everybody else gets new roles. And the one thing that they do now that they're nerfed, there's only one thing that they do, in my opinion. And it's and and now that now that that starts being understood, I think that will hurt Harlequins, and we'll start seeing them go away. I think Custodes that got hit too hard and are already gone from S tier. Yeah, they're they're nothing. So I think you're talking. I think you're talking Tau. I think you're talking Eldar. Um, and I think Eldar is going to be hard to play. So I think that that's going to be a thing you need to keep into account when you're preparing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be Nits. And and I have no gauge for where Knights go. I think they're. I think they've got some really strong rules. But the thing that you don't know about Knights till you see twenty two hundred games whatever on the table is that really good players beat Knights by playing the mission. And can you do that? I know they can be obsec. I know they have heroic intervention. Like, there's a lot of stuff to stop you from doing that. But if mm -hmm. I have good terrain and I hide from the night player playing the mission, do I win? Is a question that I don't think is answered. Yeah. And that we'll question is what. And that question also: Are there gun lines that just end the knights? Is the other question. And if yeah. those two questions, the, the answers to those two questions will tell us whether knights. Fall into yeah, if, this here or not. If four hammerheads is a thing and each pair of hammerheads drops a big knight a turn, knights don't have any kind of play. They can't call themselves S tier, and they'll be the greatest gatekeeper of all time. But we'll have to see what uh what exactly it is that they bring to the table other than that. Uh commenter asks, uh didn't didn't I say that Harleys don't have play against Nids? Harleys definitely didn't have play against Nids yesterday. Um, because double Maliceptor just they don't have a solution for that. They have to get like one specific character into combat with you. Uh, and even then, it's just not enough. Now it's interesting. I'd be curious to to play the matchup a couple more times, but I'm not scared of it. Um, unless the there's a pretty star arc player skill discrepancy there. Um, so we'll. It also sounds we'll like the stats are wicked bad. Oh, is for this, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this it's actually Doctor Stats Dad that's talking, or is he someone quoting Doctor Stats Dad? I think I think I think that's I think that's actually uh, Mister uh, or Dr. not Mister, but a doctor, Doctor Stats Dad, indeed. Yeah, so Dr. Stabstad says that, that uh 33% win rate for Quins and Nids right now before this nerf to Nids. So interesting. Interesting. My the thing about Harlequins is the same thing that I talked about in eighth edition. The rules mm -hmm. were are not eighth edition, excuse me, the beginning of ninth edition, and they mm -hmm. were winning a lot. The rules were really good and they were winning a lot. That there's a there's a thing that isn't talked about, which is a book comes out. And it says, this is the thing that I do. This is the problem that I, I, I'm giving the game. And it inevitably gets nerfed if it's too strong. But while that's happening, the entire meta, the entire game, also is figuring out two things. What do I take against this army? And how do I play against this army? And I think that Harlequins suffer more than most books in early ninth and now from people learning how to play against them. I've watched a bunch of bat reps and games with Harlequins, and they get misplayed a lot just rules mistakes and when you see a lot of rules mistakes from a book that's that good that tells me that people are getting gotcha that are people are getting gotcha pretty hard so i think that one of the things that here it that um excuse me the harlequins will struggle against is just simply age i think the longer the more reps people have into harlequins is is a really big problem for them because they can't fundamentally change their list they don't have enough options to be like okay Everybody like Michael Tempe had great success saying this is the Necron list that everyone else is preparing for. So I'm going to play this Necron list and just play better than my opponents. I don't think Harlequins have that. I don't think there's enough nuance in there to be able to make that change. Whereas Eldar do, you know, Eldar, you could say, oh, Hale's not working anymore. I'm going to play Elfway. Oh, Elfway's not working anymore. I'll play Bealtan All Aspect Warriors. Uh, Nids are the same thing. Oh, Le Leviathan's not working anymore. I'll play Gorgon and, and deploy on the line against you. Mm -hmm. I'll play all Tyranid. Like, there's tons of options. Tau is in the same boat. For, lots of people still playing Triple Storm Surge. So we're still yeah, seeing variety just... there. Mm -hmm. Harlequin, it's hard to hang if you're Harlequins. Uh, unless they end up being pulled into Drakari and Craft of Eldar 
in meaningful ways, is what I would say. I monologued for a bit there, but I, I, I have strong opinions about elves, elves in the meta, <laughs> as you'd expect. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so who did we forget? Guards still suck. Yep, guard uh, got nerfed. Death Guard are still bad, even with Death Armor Guard of Contempt. Death Guard also got nerfed. No, no, Death Guard are bad because of Armor of Contempt. As are Guard. Uh, Astro Militarum and Death Guard got these massive buffs that don't nearly compare to how big of a nerf it is for them to have to deal with Armor of Contempt, so... Yeah. The day that my position. friends to play Guard are saying, hey, I already couldn't beat Space Marines, and you know what, now I really can't beat Space Marines. <laughs> so, uh, that's rough for Guard, but they have a new codex coming at some point this year, I'm sure. I, I think the other thing to comment on is I'm really interested to see where Grey Knights end up now. Um, this is probably bad news for them because a lot of their ability to ability to hang with Nids was, if they had it, was based on the fact that we were such a psychic dependent army. We're going to move away from that, and thus we're going to move away from the things that Granites have a lot of play into. We'll see what ends up happening, uh, large scale. But I think that might be they, they might they might come up a tick or two. Uh, I know that um, Noah are. was telling me the other night that there's a really interesting list that has a Castellan that outflanks with. A gazillion Grey Knight Marines. That that's a list that exists. Um, now I don't, guys. If Noah's wrong, I'm sorry. Like I, I don't, I don't know Grey Knights well. I've not read cover to cover the Nid books. But he's saying you can have a Castellan that doesn't break all of your Grey Knights BS, and so you get like 40 Grey Knight dudes and the Castellan. The Castellan can outflank, so you don't have to have it get shot on the first turn if you don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. The Catalan does, you know, twenty mortals in addition to a bunch of other damage because that's how it that's how it roll now. And the, but in addition to that, the Grey Knights are guys are durable, standing in terrain, playing the hell out of the mission. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting list, honestly, because like Grey Knight in, Grey Knight infantry is so good. It's durable and it hits hard, and then they have that obnoxious secondary that they just get fifteen on. So like, if you have a list with a with a really good Castellan that I have to deal with, and you're going to score 100 points if I don't, in, in addition to that, while I'm dealing with that, that could be really good. That could be yeah. a, that could be a really good thing. Now, I'm just sharing that because Noah mentioned it two nights ago, and it sounded interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the meta is changing. Like, as Knights being able to travel in player, which I think is a great way to describe it, uh, Knights being able to travel in player is going to make the entire meta explode. Because I don't know if you guys know this, but Imperium has rules. Like, there are so many Imperium books that do so many different things. I firmly believe that the best knight list isn't going to be Mono Knights. There's going to be knights being slammed into a something that is gross, and it's going to be a real problem. And we're going to see that on the Chaos side immediately, because everybody's already talking about Knights and Thousand Suns, which is an obvious thing to do that I think is going to be incredibly powerful. I actually think that'll be the most powerful thing that Chaos has seen in years. I think that will be their best list in years. That's what I think. Maybe I'm wrong. I believe it. Okay. So that's our meta take. I don't think we forgot anybody that is worth talking about. Uh, I think there's a Marine list with Armor of Content that we haven't seen that's really good. I think time is needed on that. Uh, but yeah, Seth Oster says he doesn't fear knights. So that's good. Oop. Seth Oster's playing four hammerheads. So yeah, good for him. <laughs> um. Oh, if orc! Oh, he's not scared with orcs. Okay, well, he, Seth, he, you he should played, go read the night book. He played Lucas's orc list into mm -hmm. Imperial Knights and wrecked them mm -hmm. because Imperial mm -hmm. Knights do not know what to do if you have a hundred close combat bodies running at them. Mm -hmm. The real, from what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing in the book so far, is Imperial Knights want to sit back and daka daka, and Chaos Knights want to run up a punchy punchy. And if you punchy punchy the Imperial Knights or you daka daka the Chaos Knights, that's kind of your approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but a list that can do both of those things well enough is a thing. So, uh, personally, I'm playing Fire Prisms that ignore end goals. And so I'm going to hope that that works well against them. Uh, but I'm going to, this weekend, I'm going to make a bat rep uh, playing uh, Hail of Doom in tonight so that people can see kind of how that looks because that's a big question. All right. Tyler, thanks for joining me. We will try thanks to do me. stuff like this every time a big change happens. We'll try to get experts on to talk immediately. Uh, this will be hitting the podcast feed and the YouTube feed in a little while, based on Tyler's availability. <laughs> like now, is it good? Like, are you are you going to do it now? <laughs> well, we'll, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll try. I'll try to get this up in the next couple hours. Okay, cool. So this is going to hit the podcast feed and it's going to hit the YouTube. Thank you everybody uh, for watching. If you haven't done this, here's the easiest ways to support us. 
slam that subscribe button on YouTube. That costs you nothing. It helps us a lot. Uh, go find, uh, go, go take a look at us and see if you like what we're doing. And if you do, there's two great ways to support us. Uh, the first way is you can join our Patreon group. Uh, all of that money goes directly into the network. Nobody gets, nobody takes money out of that. Uh, and the Patreon fee, all it does, lets you get into the best discord in the world for 40k. Lots of people in there talking all the time. Tons of people will tell you in there will tell you that it's the best discord in 40k. I've not been in the other one, so I'm just quoting my quoting my listener. But <clears throat> gets you in there. Tyler's in there. All of our all of our hosts are in there from all of our shows. Uh, also on YouTube, you'll see there's a we've made a we made we've made an incredible amount of content, and there's a bunch of content that's under our premium area that's called that's in the members area. Get to that. There's a join button. That join button will get you all of the bat reps. Some of them are, are are back there. It gets you the extra content from Bike Club every week. It gets you the extra content from Case in the Narrative every week. And someday it will get you bonus content from BiffPod TNG. We just don't know what that is yet. So we're going to keep putting content back there. That's also $10 a month. You can get that by clicking join. Those are the best ways to support us. But subscribing on YouTube, that's the big one. Because subscribers on YouTube affects how YouTube's algorithm works. So if you could do that under Best in Tabletop, that'd be great. Thank you, everybody. Colin and Tyler out. We'll talk to you guys soon. Tyler's back on Saturday for for BiffPod TNG. I'm back on Sunday for BiffPod OG. Uh, and then Fight Club's back at you Tuesday. I don't think this is the Frontiers week. So they're back next week. I think they came out next week. They're every other week. So thank you, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now.